Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Thank you, worship team, band, choir. It's incredible. I'd like to pause in this moment collectively as God's people. Those of you in this room and watching online and ask that you would pray. Would you pause and pray and ask the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of our soul, for the Holy Spirit to have freedom in this place. And God, this is your moment. You are the Messiah, the risen God. We worship you today. Have your way, Jesus. I pray this in the name that is above every name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, no golf clapping in church. You're going to clap, clap. Thank you for joining us on Easter Sunday at the Journey Church. Christianity rises or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. Disprove it and you have disposed of Christianity forever. But that's impossible because of three words. Jesus is alive. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is alive. Alive. Say it with me. Jesus is alive. Now, Easter is different for a lot of people. For some, it's all about the bunny and egg hunts and candy. And I, I'm not demonizing candy. I, I love Easter candy. But peeps are of the devil. They are satanic. For some, it's a religious event. It's all about a new outfit. And some of you have a new outfit, and it, it looks dope. It looks extra. Rockin', snatched, uh, shook, vintage, which means outdated, okay? For some, it's a religious event. The event is more, uh, more popular than the person. It's all about going to church, eat lunch, and see you next year. For others, it's just another day on the calendar. You get up, you eat breakfast, you just live the day. But for Christ followers, for believers, Easter is a reminder, the rumor is true, Jesus dropped, kicked death, the grim reaper in the throat box. Come on, church. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything. If Jesus doesn't defeat death, turn out the lights, the party is over. There's no reason for us to gather. It's just another day on the calendar, and Christianity is just another empty religion of empty promises. But it's not empty. The only thing empty is the grave. And that's why we celebrate Jesus paid an unbelievable price to send an undeniable message of grace, love, and forgiveness. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And today, I want to take us all the way back to the first Easter found in Matthew 28. And I want you to see this story with fresh ears and fresh eyes. The Bible says, starting in verse 1, After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. The Bible says there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Oh, man, come on. 
The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, just as he promised. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly. and Tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. What an incredible and insane story. The angel told Mary and Mary, go tell his disciples, Jesus is alive. Which brings up an interesting question. Where are his disciples? Let's Bible surf. If you have your Bible, if you have the Bible app, go to John chapter 20, verse 24. Watch this. Where are his disciples? The Bible says, starting in verse 24, now Thomas which was one of Jesus' disciples called Didymus. I think I would stick with Thomas. How about you? (laughs) Now Thomas, which was one of Jesus' disciples called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Came from where? The dead. Jesus defeated death. So the other disciples told him, told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Jesus had been crucified. He's dead. He's put in a borrowed tomb. And all of his disciples, except for Thomas, are sitting in a room with the doors locked, scared because they thought, we're next. Kill the leader. Kill the movement. Then then something cray-cray happened. The Bible says Jesus walked right through the wall. He walked through the wall and said, peace, be still. Now, I don't know about you, but that would freak me out. Imagine you were at Uncle Fred's funeral, and all of a sudden he sits up in his coffin, his casket, and says, What's up? Peace be still. I'm just speculating, but that would be a perfect day for an adult diaper. Right? Because someone defeating death isn't a daily occurrence. Yes, some people escape death, some people defy death, but no one has ever defeated death like Jesus. Jesus conquered the grave. He came back from the dead just like he promised. But where is Thomas? Where is Thomas? Did the other disciples send him to the Jiffy store? Hey, DT, it's his nickname. It stands for Doubting Thomas. If you're a church person, you get that, okay. Why don't you take one of the camels and go grab us a 12-pack, 12 disciples, and some big bags of Doritos? We've been sitting in this room for three days, and we got the munchies. We're hangry. I don't know where Thomas went, but when he got back to that room, I imagine, I imagine the other disciples were staring at him and shaking their heads in silence. And Thomas is like, what? What, did I miss something? You sure did, bro. The resurrected Jesus just walked through the wall. The other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He's alive, Thomas. Guess what? Some of you in this room and watching online who are still searching and seeking for the answer to life, you have seen Jesus. You've seen the Lord. It's true. You've seen Jesus through your parents, your grandparents. Maybe it's your spouse, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, co-worker. And you know they have something you don't like, peace and joy. His name is Jesus. How long will you try to fill that emptiness inside of you with everything this world offers but doesn't satisfy you? How long? Jesus is the only one who can fill that emptiness inside of you. It's time for some of you to move past secondhand information and experience a firsthand transformation of God's amazing grace. Or maybe some of you in the room or watching online are like Thomas in our text, where he said in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas wanted evidence. Look what the Bible says in verse 26. A week later, his disciples 
were in the house again, and, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked, still locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Pastor Darrell paraphrased, Yo, Thomas, I heard you wouldn't believe I'm alive unless you saw me with your own two eyes. Open up, big boy. Here I am. Stop doubting and believe. Well, well, preacher, Pastor Darrell, I just need more evidence. I need more evidence. Okay, not a problem. Let's just read the Bible. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you drop down to verse 10 in that same chapter, it says he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He he came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. These verses blow my freaking mind. Think about it. The Word who became flesh predicted He would become flesh before He was ever born. Put that in your rolled up paper. Smoke that evidence for a moment. If you're going to smoke something, make sure it's good. Let that truth sink deep into your soul. Do you need more? Need more evidence? 700 years before Jesus came to earth, the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, predicted the exact location where Jesus would be born, Bethlehem. What are the odds? Seven centuries, seven centuries before Jesus would show up, the exact circumstances of his birth would be foretold. What are the odds? 1,000 years before Jesus' birth, King David would predict the exact method of his death. His death, a method that didn't even exist yet. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. What are the odds? Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, would predict the exact time Jesus would come, 500 years before he came. What are the odds the prophet Isaiah would predict the Messiah, hashtag Jesus, would be born of a virgin? Did you hear what I just said? Born of a virgin, not a vegan, but a virgin. And I'm not hating on you vegans, but I do have one question. (laughs) Just one. How do you milk an almond? (laughs) Over 300 prophecies. Not three. 300 prophecies in this book have been fulfilled to perfection, including Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. DePaul University calculated the odds to be 1 in 27 zeros. 27 zeros for every prophecy to be fulfilled. But it happened because Jesus is not a myth. He is the Messiah. This book, the B-I-B-L-E, It's not a book of predictions. It's a book of promises. What God says, He does. This book is truth. Thomas saw Jesus and he said in verse 28, My Lord and my God. Then then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The Bible says Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you, that you, it's personal, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When Jesus stepped onto the pages of human history, it was a rescue mission to save humanity from its sin. Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man, talking about Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? 
I was lost. You were lost. All of humanity lost. There is no vocabulary, uh, picture, or reenactment that can convey to us the pain and agony Jesus suffered on the cross for our sins. The Bible says he was brutally beaten with a cat of nine tails. Flesh and muscle was ripped from his body. He was mocked and spit on. For six hours, Jesus struggled to just breathe because he was suffocating. And scripture tells us while Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth, he prayed a prayer of forgiveness. Not revenge, not retribution or retaliation, but forgiveness. Jesus said, forgive them. Forgive them. The book of Isaiah says Jesus' body was so mangled it was unrecognizable. Jesus' pain and death transcended time and his prayer on the cross of forgiveness echoes all the way back to the garden, all the way back to Adam and Eve where sin was set into motion. We're all born into sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Talking about a physical death and a spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. It says, He, Jesus, watch this, personally carried our sins in His body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By His wounds we are healed. Jesus endured punishment for our sins. The Bible says God made him sinless Jesus to be sin for us. Sin had to be atoned for. So Jesus became the recipient of God's wrath and judgment. Jesus died for the penalty of our sins. But he rose again for our freedom. When you step into a relationship with Jesus, you are set free. The evidence of the resurrection and Jesus being the only answer to eternal life is overwhelming. Easter is a story of power, forgiveness, and redemption that demands a response. And the cold hard facts, the cold hard facts about needing more evidence is crystal clear in Romans chapter 1 verse 20. All of it summed up right here. And the Bible says, forever since the world was created... From the beginning, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything who made? God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they, every person, have no excuse. No excuse. Zero excuses for not knowing God. I know you know this. But Psalms 89, 48 says no one can live forever. All will die. It's statistically proven that 10 out of every 10 people die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Eternity is real. And you are going to die. Kick the bucket, bite the dust. You and I can't avoid it. One day your heart will beat for the last time and you will check out of Hotel Earth and spend eternity somewhere forever. And forever is a long time to get it wrong. Life is not a dress rehearsal. You get one shot at this thing called life and that's it. When you take your last breath, where will you, you spend eternity? And I get it. Life is busy. Some are graduating high school, going to college, getting married, starting a job, having kids, chasing careers, climbing the corporate ladder and planning for retirement. But all of that is temporary and pales in comparison to eternity. I need every person in this room and watching online to lean in and listen. Hell is a real place. And I know that's not popular preaching in 2023, but it's biblical. Hell is not a state of mind. It's not metaphorical. You don't annihilate or cease to exist when you die. Hell is not life on earth and all people go to heaven. That's BS. That's bullshit. What were you thinking? 
Hell is a permanent place of complete darkness and torment. Once you're there, your destination is sealed forever. When Jesus defeated death, he defined the relationship. Jesus is our only hope. And the resurrection of Jesus demands a response. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Revelation 3. Jesus said, I stand at the door. A a metaphorical door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. In this text, God uses a door as a symbol of salvation. God does the knocking, but it's your responsibility to open the door. It's called free will. The Holy Spirit will draw you, but you have a choice to respond or reject. Webster's Dictionary defines a door as anything that provides a means of access. Jesus is the only access to God. I know people say all the time, uh, there's many roads to God. No, there's not. Jesus is the only entrance, only access to God. The resurrection of Jesus is powerful and it's personal. No one else can open this door for you. And here's the warning Jesus gives all of us in Luke chapter 13. And I want you to listen to the words of Jesus. He said, when the master of the house talking about Father God, has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Jesus said a time will come when the Holy Spirit of God will no longer draw you to the door of salvation. And according to Scripture, once the door is locked, It will be locked forever. The enemy doesn't want you to walk through the door of salvation. He wants you to sleep through another opportunity. He wants you to roll the dice and gamble your very soul. He wants you to be separated from God forever. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, it was a proclamation. He is the only way to God. And it was a proclamation and an invitation to experience eternal life. The cross invites all of us to come and be made new. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Jesus died to make outsiders and insiders. Jesus died for anyone from anywhere who's done anything. Perhaps this is your opportunity to walk out of darkness into light. When every head bowed, every eye closed. The purpose of bowing your heads and closing your eyes is to remove the distractions. Anytime I present the gospel... Try not to play games or create gimmicks. Because if I can talk you into something, someone else can talk you out of it. But when Jesus changes your life, it's a done deal. One encounter with Jesus will send you home a new person. Many did it in our first experience. And so if you are here and you've been searching and seeking and looking for the answer to life, and Christ is drawing you. He's knocking on the door of your heart, and you're ready to open that door. Pray a prayer in the silence of your heart. Just say, Father God, I repent of all my sins. I forsake my ways, and I invite you, Jesus, into my life. Set me free from the ways of this world. I'm yours. I wave the white flag. I place my entire 
trust in you and you alone. With heads bowed and eyes closed. And if you just invited Jesus into your heart. The Bible says salvation is not a private thing. It's all about going public. It's not something that we cover up. It's something we celebrate and tell others. So if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, you truly meant it. I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, I want you to raise your hand and hold it high as a testimony. You just said yes to Jesus. You ready? One, two, three. Hold your hands up high. Hold them up high. Hold them up. Now I want you to look at me. Keep your hands up and look at me. Did you mean it? 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 Right here. Did you mean it? Did you mean it? Back in the back. Did you mean it? 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 Over here. Did you mean it? Did you mean it? All the way back in the back. Hands. Did you mean it? Did you mean it? Hands everywhere. Did you mean it? Did you mean it? Did you mean it? Did you mean it? I want every person in the room to stand to your feet. It's about to get real. And, and Satan doesn't want you to take this next step. He wants you to stay right where you are and, and not leave. But remember, giving your life to Christ is not a private thing. It's about going public. And so I'm going to count to three. When I hit three, I want you to leave your seat and come stand down here at the front. If you meant it. If you're ready to turn away from the things of this world and follow Jesus, this is your opportunity. One, two, three. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come stand at the front. You prayed that prayer. Come down here and stand. Come on. Did you mean it? 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 This is incredible. But can I be honest? There were a lot more hands that went up. And I know leaving your seat is so hard. Because you think, man, people know my life. They know what I've done. Who cares? Jesus just saved you. He just cleansed you from all of your sins. You've been set free. Who cares what people think? And so I'm going to, God, give people the courage to come. I'm counting to three one more time. Last chance. One, two, three. Who else? Come on. Someone else. Someone else. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Everyone standing at the front, you just made the most incredible decision of your entire life. Hallelujah. You were pre-wired for eternity. And God ordained this moment for you to be here on this Sunday, on this Easter. So I want you to look at what you're wearing. Remember this day. Because the devil's going to come and try to snatch what you believe is true to be a lie. And so you go home and you write it down. On this day, I gave my life to Christ. Today, I'm following Jesus. The world's going to come after you. The enemy's going to come after you. But you have a church who loves you and wants to help you walk out this thing called the Christian life. And your next step is baptism. And so we want to celebrate with you, we want to pray with you, and we want to help you take your next step. And so to my left is some of our team and Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul, hold up your hand, six foot twelve over here. <laughs> Everyone that just walked down, I want you to follow him to my left. He's going to take you outside. They're just going to get your information. 
talk about baptism, and celebrate what you just did. So will you follow Paul this direction? Come on. Y'all go this way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God, we thank you. God, I remember as an 18-year-old boy giving my life to you and how you have forever changed my life. And so, God, I pray for each decision, those who just left this room and those who are still sitting in the chair, who are standing, who raised their hand. God, I pray that you would give them the courage to tell someone Don't let this opportunity go by, God. God, we love you and everything that's just taken place. You get all the credit. Not this church, not this pastor. It's all you, God. So we celebrate you. We love you and praise you. And all God's people said, amen.